Good morning everybody and greetings from Esdale Gardens. Today we're carrying on with our sermon series on the prophets and how we too can be prophets today. Unable to leave home, a shortage of food, inability to meet up freely. Does this remind you of anything? This is actually about 590 BC. Jerusalem is under siege from the Babylonians and Jeremiah has spent the last 40 years warning Judah that one day they will be answerable to God for their continual disobedience and their sinfulness. Before we start, let me introduce you to a few of the key players. We have King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, a city to the east of Jerusalem. During the time that Jehoiakim was king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Jerusalem, took Jehoiakim prisoner and carried Jerusalem off into exile. We have King Zedekiah, who Nebuchadnezzar made king in place of Jehoiakim. He did evil in the sight of God. And then we have Jeremiah. He is actually a key player here but you might have noticed he wasn't even mentioned in our Bible reading for this morning. It is actually difficult to see the role that Jeremiah is playing, but don't you worry, all will be revealed. So Jerusalem has been taken over by the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar has put Zedekiah on the throne. However, Zedekiah rebels against the king of Babylon so Nebuchadnezzar again marches with his whole army against Jerusalem. He camps outside the city, keeping it under siege. This causes famine in Jerusalem and people do not have enough to eat. King Zedekiah and his army break through the city walls, trying to flee for Araba, but the Babylonian army pursues them, catches them and takes them to Nebuchadnezzar who kills Zedekiah's sons and takes out Zedekiah's eyes before carrying him off to Babylon. The Babylonians then entered Jerusalem, burnt down the temple, the royal palace and all the houses. Nebuzaradan, the commander of the Babylonian guard, carried the remaining people into exile, all except the poorest people who stayed to work the vineyards and the fields. To find out Jeremiah's part in this story, we have to turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 39, where the same story is told. It says in this chapter, Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had given these orders about Jeremiah through Nebuzaradan, commander of the imperial guard. Take him and look after him. Don't harm him, but do for him whatever he asks. Nebuchadnezzar didn't want anything bad to happen to Jeremiah and he wanted to, to give him whatever he wanted. It might have been because he knew that Jeremiah had tried to get the people to surrender to the Babylonians without bloodshed and this could have been Jeremiah's chance to get away from all the unrest. He didn't take that option but chose to stay in Jerusalem with the scattering of poor people to whom Nebuchadnezzar had given lands and whom he had allowed to stay in Judah. Jeremiah knew that there would be affliction during the siege because he had prophesied it, yet he stayed with his people. It is this that we're looking at today, Jeremiah prophesying to God's people, bringing uncomfortable words, but staying with them as they live through the consequences of their disobedience and sinfulness. We are still in our sermon series, Would That We Were All Prophets, and Moses saying, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. If we want to be like one of God's prophets, what can Jeremiah teach us that might help us?
The Book of the Prophet Jeremiah Jeremiah was an Israelite priest who lived and worked in Jerusalem during the final decades of the Kingdom of Southern Judah. He was called as a prophet to warn Israel about the severe consequences of breaking their covenant with God through their idolatry and injustice, and he even predicted that the empire of Babylon would come as God's servant to bring this judgment on Israel by destroying Jerusalem taking the people into exile. And sadly, his words became reality. Jeremiah lived through the siege and destruction of Jerusalem and witnessed the exile personally. So the book begins with God calling Jeremiah to be a prophet, and he's given a dual vocation. He will be a prophet to Israel, but also to the nations. And his words will both uproot and tear down, but also plant and build up. In other words, he's going to accuse Israel and warn them of God's coming judgment, but he also has a message of hope for the future. I wonder what it would be like to be 20 years old and have God ask you to be his spokesman asking you to go out into the streets and tell the people that disaster will surely befall them if they don't change their sinful ways and turn to him. How difficult would that be? That is what Jeremiah did and had been doing for most of his life. He had courage, he had endurance, but most of all he trusted God and he was obedient. He took God's word to his people, though it told of impending disaster if they didn't change their ways. It grieved Jeremiah to finally see the people of his nation carried off to captivity as a result of their disobedience and sin. He says in Lamentations 2, My eyes fail with tears, my heart is troubled. Jeremiah was a prophet. He took messages from God to his people, but he was a compassionate man. Yes, he delivered harsh messages, but then he stayed with his people and didn't walk away. Tom Wright, in his book, God and the Pandemic, says that Jesus brings to a peak the Old Testament prophetic tradition. So what the prophet started in the Old Testament Jesus brought to perfection in the New Testament. Tears, a locked room, and doubt. Again, does this remind you of anything? This is in fact immediate post-crucifixion time. On Easter Sunday morning, the three women took their tears and sadness to the tomb to put perfume on Jesus' dead body. Their world had been turned upside down and they couldn't look forward. The disciples were scared and had locked themselves in a room. They were fearful of what might happen to them if they were found and known to be followers of Jesus. Thomas wasn't there when Jesus came to the locked room. He was full of doubt and couldn't believe the disciples' news of Jesus' resurrection. Jesus got alongside each of these and gave them the reassurance they needed. He didn't leave them at their lowest point. He didn't judge their reaction, but gave them what they needed to move forward. Mary heard Jesus say her name. That was enough. Jesus came and stood amongst the disciples. That was enough. Jesus showed Thomas his wounded hands and that too was enough. He was there for them and gave them hope. Which takes us back to Jeremiah. It could be said that Jeremiah's lasting legacy is one of hope. One of the most quoted verses in the whole of the Bible comes 10 chapters earlier in Jeremiah 29, where it says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you a hope and a future. This was addressed to the exiles in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had already removed some Jews to Babylon, although the total destruction of Jerusalem was still to come. Jeremiah writes to the exiles to tell them that the people would return to the land after 70 years. Then he reassures them in verse 11 that God has not forsaken them they will be restored. God's plans for his chosen people were for good 
and not for disaster, to give them a future and a hope. From Jeremiah to Jesus, we see the importance of getting alongside people, giving reassurance and giving hope. We can all be prophets and we can look to Jesus to show us how to get alongside people, sharing God's message and giving them hope in a future in God's kingdom. For us to do this, we need to put Jesus at the centre of the problem and think, what would he do? Unable to leave home, isolated, fearful for the future, unable to meet up freely. Does this remind you of anything? Maybe a coronavirus pandemic lockdown. Graham Tomlin, Bishop of Kensington, when asked whether this pandemic has shaken his faith in God, replied that it hadn't, because in that faith he found hope, which he felt was exactly what was needed in the middle of a situation like this. I don't think this virus does shake my faith in God. When I think about the virus, it seems to be something that just simply destroys and attacks life indiscriminately. It rips people away from families. It causes grief. And to me, that doesn't sound like God. In addition to that, in the Bible, we often read about how there is a power at work in the world that is seeking to undermine and destroy life and love and creation. And when Jesus encounters evil and sickness and death, he doesn't just explain it away. He doesn't simply accept it as just one of those things. He attacks it. He fights against it. He prays against it and he heals the sick. So it seems to me that evil in God's world is not something we just simply accept. It's something that God fights against if Jesus just tells us anything about the nature of God. And so I think in this virus, it's telling us something more about ourselves than it's telling us about God. At the end of the day, the reason why Christians believe in God is not because we have an answer to the problem of evil. In a way, there can't be an answer to the problem of evil because evil is the absence of answers. There can be no reason for evil because evil is the absence of rationality. There can be no point to evil because evil is in its very nature pointless. But at the end of the day, you can decide whether because of suffering or whatever other reason that you don't believe in God. You delete God because you can't believe in a good God who allows such a world to happen. But by doing that, have you solved the problem of evil? Well, you haven't. You've still got to face coronavirus. You've still got to face suffering. You've still got to face death. What we have done if we do that, if we delete God, is we've taken away any hope that it ever might be any different. And what we find in Christian faith is hope that there is a way through. There is a God who stands with us in the middle of suffering and a God who promises that suffering and evil are temporary and not permanent. Christian faith gives hope. We as human beings were not meant to live without hope. And that's why I believe in God. And that's why the virus doesn't ultimately shake my faith in God. Because in that faith, I find hope, which is exactly what I need in the middle of a situation like this. We all need hope. The hope that this will end. The hope that there is good in the future. The hope that there are good plans for us. Plans to prosper us and not to harm us. It seems that maybe what Jeremiah was offering by getting alongside people and giving them hope is what God wants us to do for people today as his prophet. We wonder what is going on. We wonder why it is happening. We wonder what we're supposed to do about it. This is a plague and plagues aren't new. In the first few centuries, when sickness struck, the rich rushed to the hills, but the poor stayed behind and were left to suffer. The early Christians also stayed behind, got alongside the poor people, nursed them in their sickness and gave them hope in a future with Jesus. This pandemic gives us a real opportunity to get alongside others those who feel isolated, those who are fearful for the future, those whose lives have been turned upside down through bereavement, those who wrestle with doubt, and those who fear for their own health. We might be one of those who feel isolated or fearful for the future. 
we might have had our lives turned upside down through bereavement. We might be wrestling with our doubts and worrying for our own health. We might be in a place where it is hard to see what hope we have in the future. Jeremiah's words can bring us comfort. We have a God who has good plans for us that give us a hope and a future. In our weakness, we have to try to trust God and we have to remember that Jesus doesn't leave us at our lowest point. He doesn't judge us, but walks with us if we let him, reassuring us and wanting to give us what we need to move forward. For those of us who are in a better place right now, we can look to Jesus to see how we should get alongside people. He is our role model. He had time for everybody. He had the right words for everybody. He took the right tone with everybody. He knew where they were and what they needed. He was empathetic and compassionate, but he didn't shy away from saying and doing the right thing. He was calm and resolute when things got tough and he faced opposition, but mostly he was there for people and he was available to them. He was prepared to deliver God's message and stay with them as they muddled their way through their sinfulness, their sorrow, their weakness, their worry. We have to carry that on now. Jesus has no hands but our hands. He has no feet but our feet in this world. We have to be God's prophet in this world, delivering messages and living them out with his people to whom we were instructed to give them knowing that sometimes it might be tough, but recognizing that we are doing the will of our God who loves and cares for each of us very much.